Okay. Uh, for you that may not know me, I'm Fred Borum with the University of Arkansas. Today we're going to talk about another shift in uh, uh, cotton prices. If you notice in your program, it doesn't have that question mark. I don't know why that somehow the question mark didn't get over there. So I've been around cotton reading for a, a lot of years. In fact, I, uh, I gave a presentation belt Beltline this year, 50 years perspective. The last year was about 50th year involved with cotton reading. Now, I started when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> you know, that was uh, including uh, graduate school. I started in 1970 working in, on my master's degree in cotton breeding. I've seen a lot of shifts in cotton varieties over those years. And it's kind of a, a changing, evolving thing that we'll be looking at. Some of the factors that causes us to shift cotton varieties, one is simply marketing. We get new companies, and particularly we get change of companies. And I, I tell you what, I, they, these guys, they must have a stack of uh, business cards about that thick. Uh, uh, way that every, it seems like every year they change <coughs> their ownership and gonna have new business cards. But uh, that can drive some shift uh, varieties. Also new production areas, probably to a lesser extent, new production methods, those can, can uh, drive some shifts. And probably the main thing is new is better. You know, and for a breeder, it's gotta be. I, you know, if, if, if something I'm producing, a new one, if it's not better than old one, I hadn't done anything. For companies, new is better because they, uh, whether it's cars or whatever else, they want to sell you something new. So that's a, a driving force in shifting varieties. Yield plateaus, uh, getting into stagnant yields, shifting transgenes. Those are two major things that I think today are causing shifts in varieties. That's the main thing I'll be talking about covering today. And finally, genetic improvement in yield and quality. We hope this new is better is, is that chain and improvement in yield and quality. That's not always the case, but uh, let's, let's say it is. Give me some 20, 50, 51 in that. What's that? So give me some 20, 50, 51 in that. <laughs> you don't want their fiber quality though. <laughs> okay, here is uh, Arkansas uh, Cotton Acreage Yields all the way back to 1927. That's the first year I can find it recorded up to 2019. You can see it's pretty much as acreage, uh, as acreage has come down, yield has gone up. Uh, if you do a correlation, that's pretty much the case. But look at this situation right in here. Our yields kind of, uh, our acreage kind of stayed level here since about 1990, but we've had a good increase in yield. So that's not, that's not the only factor that causes this relationship. If you look at acreage alone, we had a record high yield of three and a half million acres of cotton in 1930 in, in Arkansas. I went and did some calculating that's a little over 10% of the total land mass of the state was in cotton. Uh, uh, we had some, have had some dips. Uh, uh, Agriculture Adjustment Act 1933 was the first major dip. They was getting about five cents a pound per acre at that t uh, per, per pound of cotton. So uh, certain limited acreage. And there's some real questions whether that was constitutional to do that. And I think. The lawyers have pretty much determined that was not legal, but that set the stage for all of our farm programs uh, in all crops. 1938, they reduced, uh, they had another agriculture just act. 1983 was a deal. Do you remember that one? How many of you remember that? I don't know. Uh, pick program, payment in kind. We were going to get, you know, uh, we were going to make that price go up. Well, everybody else uh, in the world realized we were going to cut our acreage. Guess what they did? They increase their acreage. Very, just a, almost no effect on total uh, uh, worldwide production. In 2015, at least in Arkansas, we had another major deal. Uh, we had low price, but also we couldn't get in the crop into the land, uh, on the land in May. So we a lot of intended acres didn't get uh, planted. Now, over that same period of time, these are the yields, state average yield, and I. I put together uh, what I think, or I want to talk about it, three, what I think are yield plateaus. As I looked at this though, after I put the, uh, last night, I was like, there's really a fourth one. There's a, and this dotted line is 10 year uh, moving average. But they're back in the uh, 40s. That was like <coughs> World War II. That was, we did not, we had very little cotton breeding, very little uh, crop improvement that occurred during that time. So there's a plateau there. This first one is a real major one, uh, and it wasn't just in Arkansas. This is national-wide. Uh, uh, Bill Meredith uh, put this together 
And you see this area here is not just a plateau, it was a yield decline. There was so much concern about yields that there was two different special sessions at the Beltline. One in 1977 where a session of 13 papers plus additional uh, couple of others that were kind of summary of those papers. And I, I'm old enough, I actually remember that. Each discipline got up and said, it's not our fault. And they would present very good data showing that no, they, uh, a lot of people thought it was that we started getting inferral and uh, herbicides, uh, trapman, that was the cause of it. Well, the weed scientists showed data, and no, that wasn't the fault. And each discipline kind of got up to that, uh, saying it wasn't their fault. But then, uh, 1982, this synchronized with just about the end of that plateau. Uh, another section of what the cotton yield uh, problem, Bill Meredith presented, I, I think, really a wonderful paper in that, that session that kind of summarized it very well. Oh, if I can get back to it. Uh, he said, uh, circumstantial evidence from this best taken strongly suggests that the cause of decreased cotton yield is largely due to our misuse of technology. The weed scientists in their research plots where they were applying, doing everything right, they, they, they uh, showed that they didn't have any yield uh, decline as a result of their herbicides. Same way with the entomologists, the uh, fertility people, but it was Eat, when we got it out on the farmer's field and using all these technology, it wasn't being used right. So I would think, I would suggest that first yield plateau was attributed to a technology drag. Now, how we recover from that plateau is we started, we had a shift in varieties. We started using short season varieties. Before that plateau, we were Delphine 16 and Stonewall 213. And for years, that's what it was, those longer season varieties. But we made this shift to short season varieties and we had to learn how to grow them as, that, as part of that technology track. We decreased our plant population. We started asking for them seed and we could start controlling because we had better seed and disease control. We could start monitoring and putting out a better, better rate of, of, of seeding. We increased uh, irrigation, particularly, how many of you remember 1980? If you're as old as I am, you remember 1980. Hottest, driest year, uh, it was horrible. And that was a trigger that really uh, uh, moved our whole uh, Mid-South area to, to start irrigating. Also, this shift of short season varieties, yeah. they needed more timely irrigation. They needed more timely water. Uh, uh, to, they were more efficient uh, growing. So then we had this great increase. In, improved nitrogen management, video analysis, improved pest management. We, we came up with the term integrated pest management. That came out of that yield plateau era. Uh, and in herbicide use, we started knowing that, uh, learning that it had to be used correctly. Now, the second plateau was not quite as, as defined. I, I called it from about 1988 to 2000. And there's really two stages within that, that uh, plateau. The first, the early part, was a technology drag. We had insects we couldn't control. Uh, worms uh, had gotten resistant to the insecticides we have, and some folks were spraying a dozen times to control worms that still weren't controlled them. So that, that caused a decrease. The latter half of, of then we got BT introduced, and the latter half of that plateau was associated with a genetic drag. What did they put the BT gene into? The old, well, it's Delphine 50. The yeah, old, the they, old they, they went right. back. So uh, it was a genetic drag that uh, come in from back crossing into our, our uh, system. So it was a genetic drag that was associated with that, uh, the latter half of that. So how did we come, recover from that? Well, one, we eradicated the bow weevil. That was a big thing in terms of helping us get out of that. BT cotton for uh, controlling uh, bow worm. We had a shift. A variety shift. The variety shift went to transgenic cotton. In Arkansas, 1995, we had 0 .3 tra uh, transgenic cottons. Five years later, we were 88.5. A year or so later, we were up at near 100%. So, part another reason we got out of the plateau was genetic improvement, but it was not due to cat, uh, to transgenes. And that's one of the main points <coughs> I want you to go out uh, look, uh, to have in your mind as you uh, listen to me today. Transgenes didn't increase yield. There's all been, been all kinds of studies with BT and any of these other transgenes. They, there's not a transgene out there that will increase yield. 
Now they'll make happy with the insects, and that will give you an increase in yield, but the, tr the BT itself will not give you an increase in yield. Uh, and the transfuse a catalyst, though, for more breeding that uh, gave us some materials that have better yield. There's a decrease in acreage. Also, we uh, got the picks and learning uh, fertilizer, better use, uh, better uh, and, and more determinate varieties to control plant growth. Now, our third plateau, uh, I'm suggesting that we're probably still in it. Uh, you see that line, but you know, it's hard to get real concerned about uh, that third plateau. Uh, Bill Robertson gave me some data last night that our five-year average in, in Arkansas uh, for the last five years, 11 over <coughs> five. It's kind of hard to get real concerned, but it's kind of plateaued at that. Is that a problem? It's well, when you take 1,500 pounds, break it. Well, <laughs> it, it becomes a problem. Well, I think this, this plateau we're in now, again, we're, we're shifting the trash genes. We're not using BT2, we're using B3 and uh, all uh, this other. So I think it, to some extent we're still dealing with the genetic drag. And the other thing is if we're, in, if we're averaging up at 11, $1,200, uh, dollars, we're 1,100 pounds, are we getting into a, a, a climatic uh, limits? Are, are we hitting about as far as we can go? And that's kind of the recovery from that this plateau three one. I think what we to sort of with the new transgenes, we're moving faster. And not they're not back crossing into such older varieties. There's not quite as much genetic drag. But I, I I'm reminded of a, a musical Oklahoma. There's a song in there, uh, Kansas Secret. A cowboy been up to Kansas City, comes back and he sings, uh, up there they've gone about as far as they can go. Now the question is, are, have we gone as, as far as we can go with yield with the climate restrictions that we have? If we have, then we've got to have some new genetic breakthroughs, not just new transgenes. We've got to come with uh, uh, different ways to, to grow that. Now. Look at this synchrony of uh, yield plateaus and transgene introduction. Uh, on, on, and I've got this dotted line is a five-year uh, average uh, yield, moving, moving average yield for Arkansas. And you can see this, the, this plateau right in here. That's when we had the transgene introduction. Another plateau, transgenes. Transgenes being introduced. In particular, you can call it, here's BT1, BT2, BT3. It's, it's really related to the BT gene introduction, not the, not the herbicide genes. I looked at this a little different way. These are synchrony uh, with the number of entries in my Arkansas variety test. And you can see, again, uh, when, when we get a new gene, they, uh, all the companies got to, they, they'll make a bunch of different new varieties and they got to figure out which ones will work in different areas. So that's where we get these big peaks uh, here's BT1, BT2, BT3. This one here, I'm not real sure how to define it, except there were some new uh, companies getting into variety test, cotton variety testing. So I think that was that peak there. So uh, the question I have, where would we be in cotton production without transgenes? For disease control, no difference, is there? There's no transgenes, so we'd be the same place we are now if transgenes had never come from. For insect control, we've eradicated boll weevil. We didn't have any transgenes to do that. Worm, that's where transgenes. We've gone B1, B2, B3. Guess what's coming next? B4. B4, very good. Yeah, that, it's our, they're already due testing. That's the, tarn, uh, the uh, aphids and... Uh, uh, paint bugs. I don't know if that's B4. I don't know if that's a BT, but I don't know if that's four. I, 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 I'm not really supposed to be. Uh, I know they're looking at a BT4 for worm control. I don't know if the the paint bug is a different number. I, I, I just don't know. I can't keep up. That's too many numbers. Uh, the question is, you know, soon after BT come out, we came out with some improved insecticides that were as good as the BT. So uh, could we have kept up? And then this, and, and to me, the BT is a classical. I got, I had my training in health plant resistance through through disease and learning the, the vertical resistance and stacking of resistance gene. Tell me when I'm through. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and to me, the BT is very similar to that stack. Uh, what we're doing is just stacking vertical genes. And guess what happens uh, when you stack vertical genes? 
the pathogen or the insect in this case, they can outrun us. And that's, I think that's what's going on. For plant bugs right now, there's no transgenes. There's one coming. Uh, and it's a, I think it's better on thrips than it is for plant bugs. Yeah. Weed control, uh, we had the single, uh, buttrol, Randall Ready, Randall Flex. Now we're uh, stacked, and I don't want to talk about those. Uh, <laughs> not in Arkansas. Either. Not in Arkansas. We will not talk about that. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, weed control would be difficult without transgenes, at least with the techniques that we have now. I think we, I, uh, Andy, I, don't, I think we'd have, we would, well, I know folks around me, I, I still farm conventional cotton, and I, there's not many, I'm about by, by myself. So that, uh, I think that's an issue. Uh, so, for yield, there's been no trace genes for increased yield, so I think we would be uh, right where we are without trace genes. Fiber quality, there's no trace genes for increased fiber quality production costs. We'd have lower seed costs. Uh, insect control, I would be willing to bet we'd be about equal. Weed control, that's a bigger problem. I don't, don't know where we'd be. And I think the real benefit of transgenes is what I call the NASA effect. Not many of you remember uh, going to the moon as I do. Uh, uh, and the real effect of the government dollars that went into the NASA program was not getting to the moon. The real benefit was these great strides as catalysts for and computer and material sciences. And I think that's kind of what, what transgenes. And the, the effect has not been so much for transgenes, but companies uh, charge a lot more, they get a lot more money, and they increase their breeding efforts, their conventional breeding efforts as well. <coughs> that might not have happened without transgenes. <coughs> so uh, emerging technology uh, likely to be available. To, uh, we'll, I think we'll just keep stacking BTGs. We're going to have this ligus uh, resistance. Maybe, and they say reniform nematode resistance, transgene. Unlikely drought tolerant, they were working on that, but as I understand, that's been discontinued. Additional stress tolerance is, is, is not likely. Yield improvement transgenes, fiber quality, hybrid cotton to, to deliver transgenes is a, is, is a possibility that's being used. Am I through? Three minutes. Three minutes. I will skip that slide then. Go to my last slide. How's that? Uh, future varietal shifts. Uh, these, go back to my first slide, the, the new companies uh, and ownership, uh, that will keep happening. I don't think anything will stop that. New production areas, maybe, might cause some shift. Production methods, uh, I think we're, we're, that will only happen if we start really being able to breed things for specific production practices. And I don't know that we're at that point. Yield plateaus is probable. Shift and trace genes, definitely. There'll be new ones coming about. Genetic improvement, hopefully. So future shifts, yes, definitely. And hopefully, and hopefully we'll have more shifts. Because without shifts, us plant breeders, cotton breeders are out of business. But that's the only way we're going to continue to have good materials and improved materials for you. Okay, time for one question for uh, Jenny educate you. Yes, sir. Well, one question I have is when you put ground up into the system, you took the cost down on herbicides to, or the cost of using that herbicide down so low that you discouraged any additional development of new herbicides. That's so there's that, always a fact, a feedback loop factor in all of these technologies that yeah, we have to deal with. That, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, we increased our, our, our produ producer, individual producer uh, acreage. Uh, the, the, we can't go back on the, I mean, in the situations on that. It's a good point. Yeah. Now we use Roundup because it's the cheapest back <coughs> that we've got. It's cheap, and it's used. On, and the trouble is, it's used on everything. The same thing with these BT genes; it's in everything, and it just incurred. And I know right now our entomologists are really trying to keep them from putting the BT uh, three in the corn, or three or four, anyway, three, yeah. three in the corn, because you if you have that, that insect has that constant diet of BT over crops. It's just a matter of time. They don't have resistance.